Which of the MCU's many fans believes themselves worthy enough to know how things will shake out upon the release of Thor, Love and Thunder? In the days after Endgame, and with this being Thor's fourth outing, the god who learns through loss may be in for a big shakeup that could ripple throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So hop on a bolt and let's ride the lightning through the biggest changes we could see in this realm. Okay, I know this might seem obvious, but at this point, the writing is kind of on the wall for our original core Avengers lineup. It seems a little like a rap party, right? Tony's gone, Nat's gone, but still gets a good ride out, and Cap, I guess, is on the moon or something. We know Clint is passing things along in his own series, and then there's a new female She-Hulk, so it's almost weird if we're still hanging on to Thor. There has been a lot of torch passing, and, you know, you hold a hammer basically the same way. It's terribly well balanced. Well, if there's too much weight, you lose power on the swing. I'm not saying I want to see the big guy go, but it kind of feels like he's at least getting the back seat, or alternatively, maybe an Odin level upgrade where we don't see him as frequently, which naturally brings us to the soon to be hammer holder. Maybe the term hammer holder isn't appropriate, because if you've read the original Sin storyline, where Jane Foster becomes Thor, you know that she holds her own pretty well. Taika Waititi has referenced the comic run by Jason Aaron as a huge influence for Thor Love and Thunder, so expect a couple twists once Jane picks up Mjolnir and Stormbreaker. The whole storyline breaks down the idea of gods and worship having to be earned instead of just given. What the hell is that? And that kind of heart running right through the center seems pretty well suited for a Taika take. After years as an arrogant, all-powerful, god-level Avenger, Thor has been taken down a peg after so much loss. We've seen him hand the new Asgard keys over to Valkyrie, so what's keeping Thor in the fight going forward? It should be no surprise in this arc for both characters that Thor is becoming a little more humble and Jane is finally finding her date with Destiny. That all being said, we never thought Jane's date with Destiny would be a ride down the lazy river. Spoilers if you haven't read the aforementioned original Sin storyline, but Jane and Thor could reunite after a diagnosis of breast cancer. After she picks up the mantle to become Thor, it cancels the work her chemotherapy is doing, which becomes a literal mortal dilemma. Again, this screams Taika Waititi's deft hand at dealing with serious subjects in a funny yet heartfelt way. The MCU always has that added benefit of elements it set up before, such as Jane having been exposed to the power of an infinity stone as a mortal. I don't know about you, but after ingesting that much ether and having reality stone juice coursing through your veins, I wouldn't assume you go through through that unencumbered as a mere mortal. Jane might be forced to pick between two bad options, so it's a good thing that someone is looking after New Asgard. While we're on the topic, the current protector is rumored to be looking for a love of her own. Valkyrie was everybody's swashbuckling, drink-swilling, BA heartthrob in Thor Ragnarok. And putting aside the off-camera antics in the tabloids, Tessa Thompson has lobbied to introduce a bisexual badass into the MCU. Originally in a scene cut from Thor Ragnarok, we were supposed to see a quick glimpse of a woman walking out of Valkyrie's bedroom, but it was cut at the last minute by the studio as it distracted from the scene's vital exposition. <clears throat> right. This is true in the comics as well, as Valkyrie has a relationship with a character named Annabelle, who is not yet part of the MCU. In the future, however, if the ruler of Asgard goes searching for a queen, I mean, let's never say never. They are introducing LGBTQ plus characters into the Eternals, so it would be nice if retroactively, we've had one all along, and love is just love, even if it comes with a little scattered thunder. We're getting to the point in the MCU where the world is not enough, and please excuse the association to the terrible Pierce Brosnan 007 role. I suppose we all have to pay the piper sometime. What we mean is that we've slowly but surely incorporated fictional locations like Wakanda, Sokovia, and Madripoor into our modern world. Now while Norway is very, very much a country, and what a country, New Asgard as a location is still finding its footing. While we catch glimpses of the charming green oceanside village in Avengers Endgame, we're definitely hoping to spend a little more time there, once inside a Thor-centric film. It could be an ideal spot going forward for the Avengers to congregate as a safe zone or a European headquarters for our more mystical minded. The possibility is always there, the Asgardians move again to a more cosmic plane, but if New Asgard is home, we hope to see it explored in a little more detail. With new Asgard comes key Asgardians, and when it comes to the original Thorcast, we'd be remiss if we did not finally figure out what happened to Lady Sif. 
After being introduced as Lady Sif in The Warriors 3, we can only assume she was busy working on a solo album when the Sif hit the fan in Ragnarok. Hela made short work of The Warriors 3 and Fandral was knocked so hard he ended up a hero in the DC universe. <laughs> However, Sif was introduced as one of Thor's closest friends from childhood, and we're hoping that the lady comes back to use her shield as a platter on which to serve up some more frost giants. Aside from being a friend of the shield on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so much S.H.I.E.L.D. talk, we haven't seen much of her. But word on the street is she was blipped out like many other Asgardians, only to be resurrected by the Hulk in Avengers Endgame. Thor Love and Thunder seems to be making a go of packing in as many Australian-born actors as possible, and if we're going fighting around the world, then who better to call than Russell Crowe? The roughnecked Aussie is confirmed to be appearing in a cameo, and when asked what role he'd be taking on, he dropped that he'd be playing none other than Zeus, the king of the Olympians. With the introduction of the Eternals, we definitely see some crossover potential there, but the Olympians in the comics are a whole Asgardian-like universe of its own to spin off, in that, like the Eternals, they were manipulated by the Celestials. Another gang of picture-perfect superhuman godlike beings could really shape things in the MCU down the road, and you don't hire someone like Russell Crowe on a laugh. The Olympians also live in a pocket dimension with a nexus being in Greece. Look man, with multiverses and nexuses being tossed this way and that in phase 4, nothing's off the table, okay? Can we just take a second here to appreciate the fact that though there have been love interests all over the MCU, we've never had a true rom-com among any of them? Pepper and Tony were a cute subplot, but it always kind of felt secondary to Tony's ambition. Ant-Man seemed closer to Luis at times than he did the Wasp, and he was kind of all about the heist. Nothing's happening. Whoa, hold on. Could we see in this film everybody actually find their one? I'm not going to say there isn't some cleanup after the staleness in Thor The Dark World, but we could all use a second, third, or I guess fourth shot at true love, right? Please Hammer, don't hurt him. By the way, if you caught that MC Hammer reference, uh, then I love you, viewer. Trips down musical memory lanes are fun, aren't they? So at this point, it's almost criminal we haven't spoken about the inclusion of the frickin' Guardians of the frickin' Galaxy. And I meant to use frickin'. With the Guardians gearing up for their third outing in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, it makes sense to have them do some setup in Thor, since the last time we saw them, they were arguing with Thor on the Milano. On-set photos have pretty much confirmed their presence down on the Australian set, and boy are we here for some playful banter between him and Star-Lord. Also on the list of god-level actors appearing in this film is Christian Bale. With Bale cast as Gore the God Butcher, the story becomes clearer as someone tired of gods, ignoring his people with their petty fights, and it totally makes sense if a mortal Jane is a god in training. If he lives up to his name, then Hemsworth's time may be running low in the MCU. Taika has said before, he doesn't like laughing at people unless they're in a privileged position or they're in authority. So in a rom-com, that sounds like a power dynamic issue to me. He knows how to mix indie movie comedy with major movie tragedy and still find that sweetness in the middle. If you've never gone back through his catalog, make sure you check out his early film, Boy. 